Hello, my name is Paul Trung. Welcome to Winning Chess the Polga Way. Today we have with us Grandmaster Susan Polga, a four-time women's world champion and a five-time Olympic champion. She's one of the most well-known chess personality in the world, as well as a prolific trainer. Today she will share with you her techniques, her secrets, and how to win chess game the easy way. Susan? Thank you, Paul. Welcome all to the, this segment of the Winning Chess the Polgar Way. I'm going to share with you a number of games based on the basic principles of chess. It will be a step-by-step -step explanation of each move. Before we start to see the games, I would like to go over with you the five most important principles of chess. Number one is to control the center. Now, what's the center? The center is the four squares in the middle of the chessboard. They are the e4, d4, e5, and d5 squares. Why is it important? Because in every battle, if your pieces are controlling the center, you can move either to the king side or to the queen side of the board very easily. That's why it's crucial that every game you need to control the center as much as possible. The second rule of thumb is to develop all your pieces as soon as possible. If you could imagine, let's say you are King Arthur and you're about to go and fight a battle. Can you win without having your troops going out and do the battle and fight? No, of course not. Same thing in chess, if you can relate to that same example. In order for you to win in chess, you have to have all your pieces out in order to fight. Without your pieces developed, you can't win a chess game that way. That's why it's very important to develop all your pieces as soon as possible. The next step is to castle as soon as possible. And I have to stress this is a very important part of the game. It doesn't matter how good your position is. It doesn't matter how much material you ahead. If you checkmate it, the game is over. You cannot win that way. That's why it is very crucial for you to castle as soon as possible. The next rule of chess is to keep all your pieces protected because in a chess game, every piece is very, very important. One might say, you know what, it's only a pawn that I just lost. I understand a pawn is only worth one point. However, that pawn can be promoted into a queen and as you, we all know, the queen is the most powerful piece in a chess game. And last but not least, to make sure that every move you make have a solid plan. Now, when you start out in chess, your plan may be one or two moves deep. As you get stronger and more experienced, your plan will get a lot deeper and there's a lot of more meaning behind it. But to make sure that you don't make a move for the sake of making a move. Every move should have a meaning. Every move should have a plan. Susan? Thank you, Paul. That was a wonderful explanation of the basic principles of chess. Now we're going to look at two games where white will follow the basic principles of chess. Black will break the rules. And let's see what happens to black. Okay, we are ready to start with our first game of this instruction. White starts with e4. e4 is one of the most common starting moves in chess. This move occupies the e4 center square as well as it attacks another center square on d5. It also has another advantage by opening up the diagonal of the bishop as well as of the queen. Black responds with g6. G6 is a, an okay starting move, even though it does not directly occupy or control the center. However, it has an advantage to it, opening up the diagonal of the dark squared bishop, getting ready to develop it to G7 along the long diagonal, which will control two center squares. White's next move is D4. 
d4 is a wonderful move. It occupies another center square as well as attacks a fourth one on e5. Now white has full control of all four center squares. It also has another advantage, opening up the diagonal of the dark squared bishop. Black plays knight h6. Wow, that's a bad move already. Knight going to the edge of the board. It certainly does not belong there. It should come towards f6, which would control the center. Also, another problem with this move is that it delays the development of the bishop. Usually, when black or white, for that matter, plays the so-called fianchetto, developing the g-pawn, you right away would want the bishop to come to g7. White plays knight f3. Again, why does the right thing? Developing, following the second rule that we discussed, as well as the first one, controlling the center. The knight from f3 controls two center squares, d4 and e5. Black responds with knight a6. That's another error. Just like we said, the other knight developing to the edge of the board, this knight developing also to the edge of the board. Again, the knight is not developing in the right direction. The right direction is, as we said, the center, the middle of the board. And that would be to develop the knight to c6, towards c6. Or, as I mentioned before, to first develop the bishop to g7. Now white plays bishop to c4. White continues the right way. Again, developing an X piece, the bishop, controlling a center square on d5, as well as it prepares the next step, another principle, to put the king in safety by castling on the next move. Black plays b6. Black farther delays the development of the king's side and putting the king in safety. It's another error. It's better to do bishop to g7 instead of b6 first. Again, b6 does not directly control the center. White plays castle. White follows the third principle that we've been mentioning, putting the king into safety. That's very, very important. You'll see what happens to black when black delays it too long. Black responds with bishop b7. That's not a bad move for a change. The bishop develops and controls two center squares, attacks the pawn on e4, as well as controls the d5 center square. White responds with knight to c3. This move develops, protects the pawn on e4 that was hanging, as well as controls a second center square on d5. And now black plays bishop to g7. Finally, it was about time. That's a good move. Black develops and controls two dark center squares on e5 and on d4. Also prepares to castle. And now white plays bishop to f4. White continues developing. Finally, all the pieces are developed very nicely, all of them controlling the center. This bishop controls the e5 square. Black plays knight to b4. That's another common mistake that a lot of beginner players do. They move the same piece twice early in the game. That's a mistake. The first thing you should do in the beginning of the game, move each piece out once to develop. As we said, preferably towards the center, not to the edge of the board. Put your king in safety. And that is black's problem, that black is delaying and delaying, castling, putting the king in safety. We'll see why it's not so good to move the same piece over and over. White plays queen to d2. This is a very typical move. It has many purposes. The most obvious one is to putting a double pressure on the knight on h6. That's very much misplaced. Also, a more general idea of the move is to connect the two rooks, which is very good to do. Black plays knight to g4. Black had not much of a choice. Because the bishop was attacking the knight, the knight had to move. Otherwise, black would lose a piece, of course. Now, moving backwards is naturally not very tempting to do. 
That's why black went to g4, but that has its own problems, as we'll see very shortly. Now white plays knight to b5. Okay, so the move is knight to b5. It has a lot of threats. Directly, the queen is attacking the knight, which is a discovered attack because the knight moved. Also, the knight itself has a direct attack on to the c7 pawn to capture it, making a fork. So it's a very, very serious threat. Black retreats the knight to a6. The only way black could defend both the knight as well as the threat of knight c7, forking the rook and the king, was to retreat the knight to a6. That's a sad thing. That's already the third move with the same piece early in the game. That's very, very bad. And now white pushes the pawn to e5. Now it's time to gain space. Also, it's a move that takes away some crucial squares. It takes away the f6 square from this knight to retreat. Now this knight is getting into trouble. If you look closely, it has no place to go. Therefore, white has now a direct threat to trap that knight by simply attacking it next move. Black responds with h5. h5 is an awkward looking move, but the purpose is to at least make the h6 square safe for the knight by the protection of both the rook and the bishop. Without making that move, after h3, the knight retreating on h6 would be lost. So that is the purpose of the move of h5. White continues with knight to g5. White plays very aggressively again, putting a new threat on the other side, on f7. Now there is a very, very serious threat of either knight taking, making a fork on the queen and the rook, just like we did before on the other side, or bishop taking on f7 also with a decisive attack. Black plays knight to h6. Black retreats the knight to protect the f7 square. White continues with queen to d3. Queen to d3 improves the position farther and it creates a tactical threat. One very important thing we need to remember that when we have a lot of positional advantages, little strategical advantages, you eventually reach a point when you need to involve tactics, cash in time, to translate, to transform the small advantages into actual material advantage or checkmate. Now in this case the threat is to actually sacrifice the knight on f7 and when black would recapture then the queen would take on g6 having a dual threat on the knight and the bishop all at once gaining at least two pawns and still maintaining the attack. Let's go back now to the position after queen d3 when it's black's turn. Black finally castles. Black did castle here, but it unfortunately causes another problem. White immediately played queen takes g6. Here all of a sudden, the pawn on g6 became unprotected because of an existing, or right, just now created pin. Because black castled, the pawn on f7 is pinned. Therefore, white could capture the pawn on g6. Now black is in serious, serious trouble. There is a threat to checkmate on h7, and there is only one way to protect against that. Rook to e8. Black needed to make some space for the king to try to run towards f8. White now plays knight takes f7. Of course, this is a totally winning position for white, and there are many ways to win, but here comes the fastest one. Knight takes on f7. Now this creates a direct threat on the queen, as well some discovered other checks moving away the knight and checkmating very quickly, as we'll see. Black captured the knight with knight takes f7. Black didn't have much of a choice if he didn't want to lose his queen, but this 
also ends the game very quickly. White played bishop to h6. White could recapture the knight on f7, which would also lead to pretty quick checkmate, but the actual quickest way to end the game is to use another pin. The fact that the bishop is pinned on g7, it cannot move away, it cannot capture the bishop, and neither can the knight. They are both pinned from the white pieces, and black cannot prevent the checkmate of next move, queen takes g7. Well, this game was a very good example of what happens when white follows all the right principles as of developing the pieces, controlling the center, putting the king in safety, while black on the other hand, breaks all the rules by not controlling the center, developing the pieces in the wrong direction, and delaying castling too far. Of course, only beginner players would play like this as black. However, it's very important to know how to take advantage of these errors, and that's what we were trying to show in this game. In our next game, we'll see a similar example, although black will play somewhat better. But the problem will be black again neglects the center. White begins this game with d4. d4 is the second most common move next to e4, also with the same idea. On the other side, it occupies the d4 center square, controls the e5 center square, and opens up the bishop's way on the diagonal as well as give some air for the queen. Black plays knight to f6. Knight to f6 is a very normal and good developing move. Unlike developing the knight to the edge of the board, this move controls the center, the e4 and d5 squares. White plays c4. c4 is the most common response in this position. It gains some space and controls the d5 square. Black responds with e6. One of the most common responses opens up the diagonal of the bishop to develop as well as it controls the d5 center square. Knight to c3. Again, a good developing move controlling two of the center squares on e4 and d5. B6. Now, this move is already an error on black's side because it does not put enough focus, doesn't fight enough for the center. The better moves for black in this position would be either d5, which occupies and attacks another center square, or to move the bishop to b4, which indirectly also controls the e4 square in the sense that it ties down the knight and white could not play e4 to occupy the center because then the pawn could be taken because of the created pin over the knight. So black played b6. White plays e4. e4 is a great move. Now white has a beautiful uh, line of pawns right in the center. White occupied another center square while attacking, again, the d5 center square. That already gives white an advantage. Black plays bishop to b7. That's a good developing move, unlike in the previous game, where black delayed the development of the bishop after playing the g6 move. Here black does not delay it, it's a good move. It develops the bishop to the right place, attacking two center squares, including the pawn on e4. Bishop to d3. White develops the bishop and protects the pawn in the center on e4, a right response. Bishop to e7. This move develops and prepares to castle, although it's a little passive. Perhaps it's more advisable to develop the bishop to a more active square on b4 to create a pin over the knight. 
knight to f3. Right continues to develop, controlling two center squares, d4 and d5, as well as preparing to castle. Black castles. Black does the right thing, puts the king in safety. White also castles. White does the same. Knight to c6. Knight to c6 seemed to be developing the knight to the right place. It controls two center squares, e5 and d4. However, the problem black will face that the knights can be chased away easily. That's why in these situations it's important to prepare the development right in a way that you black would prevent these attacking moves on the knights. Also, by putting the knight on c6, when a bishop is developed on the long diagonal, it blocks the power of the bishop. So, for example, it would be per more, more advisable to play d6 and to put the knight on d7. White plays e4. White plays e5. In this situation, it's important to take advantage of the opponent's mistake right away. Because if you just make uh, two calm moves, two quiet moves to develop, let's say, the bishop, it may give black the time to correct the error and to prevent these advancing moves, let's say, by playing d6 or such. So it's a good idea to right away use the opportunity and gain space uh, force the opponent's pieces back to more passive position. Knight to e8. The knight is best of, unfortunately, going all the way back to the 8th rank. Let's see what would happen if the knight would move to h5. It also, first of all, looks bad, putting a knight to the edge of the board. Also, there is an immediate tactical punishment for it. If you take a moment, you may want to find what, th what that is. The move is g4, which normally, of course, is a horrible thing to do, to open up right in front of your king. However, in this case, we are trapping the knight, and that's an exception. When you win serious material, you would make an exception from a strategical principle as of keeping your king safe, because having an extra knight is, of course, a far more important advantage than just keeping your pawns in front of your king. So the knight went back to e8. d5. With this move, white gains even more control and presence in the center. Also, it chases away the black knight on c6 from the control of the center. Knight to b4. Now, this knight did, it, did not need to go back all the way passively like its brother, the other knight. And it attacks, puts some pressure on the bishop on d3. In general, to trade a knight for a bishop is a good thing. White plays bishop to b1. White retreats the bishop. Now, this looks a little bit weird, retreating. However, it's only temporary, as we shall see. White soon will kick the knight back, and then white will be able to get the pieces back out. F. Six. Black is trying to get some activity, get his or her pieces back to the middle of the board by trying to trade these two pawns. A3. As I said, now white is kicking the knight back and then white is gaining space again. Knight to A6. If you look carefully, you'll see that the knight has no other place to go then back to a6. Queen to d3. As I said in the previous game, it's very important to take advantage of the opportunity that when you have space advantage, when the opponent made mistakes and uh, did break some of the opening principles, to play forcefully and to gain more advantages, to provoke more weaknesses in the opponent's position. That is the purpose of White's next move. The white coming to d3 has a very direct threat, of course, on the h7 pawn with a battery between the bishop and the queen, and this provokes 
black to weaken the king's side. G6. Black blocks the attack on the pawn on h7, and uh, however, it makes a weakness on the dark squares around the king. It would be somewhat better to block with f5. Bishop to h6. Moves like this are usually good. It develops a piece by attacking an enemy piece. So that's gaining time, gaining a tempo, as we say in chess language. Rook to f7. Black moves the attack rook away from the attack. B4. This is a move I like. It gains space and it restricts the opponent. It takes control of an important square, c5. Because if you take a look, the knight coming to c5 would cer certainly improve black's position. It attacks the queen and it centralizes the knight. So white's last move, b4, prevents that. Black captures the pawn with f takes e5. Black is trying to make some room for his pieces, the knight and the bishop and the rook opening some fires, diagonals. And white recaptures the pawn with knight takes e5. But this allows white to centralize the knight beautifully on e5 by recapturing the pawn, as well at the same time attacking the rook on f7. Rook to f6. The rook had to go away from the attack. Knight to g4. Knight to g4 chases over the rook again. Rook goes back to f7. The rook again had to move away from the attack. White captures the pawn with d takes e6. With this exchange, white forces black to ruin the pawn structure and isolate a pawn. D takes e6. Now we can see that black has an isolated and weak pawn on e6. What do we mean by isolated? An isolated pawn is a pawn that has no pawn on neither neighboring file. Knight e5. Now that white achieved the isolation of the pawn on e6, because when the rook was still on f6, the rook had a chance to recapture on e6, not isolating the pawn. Now the knight was ready to come back to e5 to gain further advantages. Rook to f6. The rook went to f6. Now, if black would try to get into an endgame by trading queens, black would lose material right away. Let's see what would happen. If black trades the queens on d3, the bishop would capture back. The only safe square for the rook is to go to f6, and then white would follow with bishop to g5. That would create a skewer, meaning the bishop attacks the rook, and when the rook would move away, the bishop would be hanging on e7. Therefore, white would win the rook for a bishop, winning an exchange. Let me put the position back. Black did not trade on d3. Rook f6. So as we saw, black would lose material right away after the trade of the queens. That's why black rather moved the rook straight away. Queen to e3. Queen e3 opens up the d-file, getting the rook to occupy it and to attack the queen. C5. Black is trying to make space for the knight on c7 to get back to play. Rook to d1. Again, this is a move, like I said, with the bishop h6, when you can develop a piece, put a piece on the right place by attacking an enemy piece, it's usually the right thing to do. And as we know, rooks belong on open files. That's what white is doing, putting the rook on the only open file in the position, attacking the queen, therewith gaining time at tempo. Black responds with queen to c8. 
The queen had only three places to go to, but all of them have problems. Moving the queen to c7 would result in a fork by the rook entering to d7, attacking, attacking the queen, and when the queen would move away, the bishop would be falling, or if the queen moves to b8, then the knight could fork by moving to d7, attacking the queen and the rook. That's why still the best answer is queen to c8. b5. White attacks a knight. Knight a to c7. The knight moved back to c7, towards the center, little too late though. Bishop to g5. And with this move, white gains material, the same way as we looked at the variation after the trade of queens. The, the rook is under attack, and if the rook moves away, the bishop will be hanging. And black resigns. In this game, black played somewhat better than in the first game we saw. Black developed, black put the king in safety. However, there was one important part black neglected. And that's the most important part of the chessboard, the middle of the board, the center. And white gained very good control of the center by occupying all the four center squares and showed black why that's important. The next game is a very, very famous game from the famous New York 1924 tournament between two great grandmasters from long time ago, Grandmaster Reiti and Bogoyubov. This game will illustrate something different than what we saw so far. It's still a fight over the center, like most chess games are. However, it will be a lot more balanced, of course, two grandmasters playing both understand that importance even back in 1924. In this game, white starts with knight to f3. This game is somewhat different than the first two we saw so far. White does not occupy the center right away, rather attacks it from distance. The knight controls two center squares, d4 and e5. This is, by the way, called the Reiti opening, named after this famous grandmaster playing this game with white. Black responds with d5. Black, on the other hand, occupies the center right away, as well as attacks the e4 square. c4. c4 attacks the center, the d5 on the d5 square. It's a temporary sacrifice that black usually does not accept, although they can. If black accepts this pawn sacrifice, white has several ways to gain the pawn back, either by right away giving a check and giving a fork, getting the pawn back, also possibly playing knight a3, attacking the pawn, getting it very soon back, or probably the most common way, simply by playing e3, and opening the attack of the bishop on the pawn. However, in this game, black did not capture the pawn. e6. That's the very solid way to respond, playing kind of a queen's gambit type of position. g3. g3 is preparing the development of the bishop on the long diagonal, which is the key idea of the Reiti opening. Knight to f6. Black does the right thing, develops, controlling two center squares, d5 and d4, just like before on the previous move. If black would take the pawn on c4 instead of knight to f6, 
The queen check is possible to gain the pawn back. White develops the bishop to g2. Absolutely the right thing. Then you play g3. Most of the time you want to follow it up right away with bishop to g2 before some trouble comes. Black plays bishop to d6. The standard normal development move Div controls the e5 center square. Of course also the more solid bishop e7 is possible. White castles. White follows another principle, putting the king into safety as soon as possible. The right thing to do. Black also castles. So far both sides play perfectly. They keep developing by controlling the center and putting the kings into safety. White continues with b3. You can notice that now that the black king already castled, the king is no longer on e8. So therefore, after black would take the pawn on c4, white no longer has this move as a check, since the king is gone. So white had to do something in order to protect this pawn. b3 directly protects the pawn and prepares the development of the bishop to b2. Of course, it's not the only way. White could protect it with d3, or with a queen, or let's say trading on d5, but this is one of the main ideas of the Raytheon right opening to delay the d4 move and to develop the other bishop also on the fianchetto on the long diagonal. Rook to e8. Black is centralizing the rook, getting ready for a future opening of the position, let's say by c takes e takes, the rook would be very handy on the e file. Although it's definitely not the only move, in fact maybe not even the best move, black could develop rather the knight, let's say to d7, or maybe try to develop the bishop, b6, bishop b7. It's certainly not a rush move to do, but it's not a bad move either. Bishop to b2. As I said, when you play b3, Play bishop to b2 as soon as possible. Knight b to d7. That's a very normal, good developing move controlling the e5 center square. d4. Finally, white made this move that in many games they do in the first move. Right away controlling the e5 center square and occupying the d4 center square. The drawback of the move, on the other hand, is that it locks up the bishop a little bit. But it's more important to have presence in the center. Another move that white commonly makes is just d3, making space for the knight on d2. But in this game, white wants to play more ambitiously by occupying the center. c6. c6 is a good, solid move, putting more backing on the center d5 square, pawn, in many cases preparing an eventual advance of the e pawn and therefore giving protection to the d5 pawn. Knight b to d2. As we can see, white developed all the minor pieces, again controlling the center e4 square. Knight to e4. If you look at this position, we can see that white managed to develop fully. Black has a little bit of a problem. And the problem is this bishop on c8 has a little bit hard time to develop. It could play b6 and then bishop to b7, but it's still behind those two pawns on white squares. So that's a difficulty a little bit in this position for black. Black is trying to play right away aggressively by occupying the center with the knight. But this is a risky adventure, as we'll see. It's maybe premature a little bit. It was still better to develop the bishop first. Knight takes e4. Now, in these situations, it's very important to act decisively and forcefully. Because, for example, if white makes some solid move, kind of improving the position with rook c1 or such, black could back the knight up by playing f5. 
and gain more space, and that could be giving black some advantages. D takes e4. Now, after the knight took on e4, it forces the d pawn to take back knight on e4 to e5. And now the white knight goes into the center on e5. Now there's another element that we did not talk yet, is the space. It's very important in chess who controls more territory. Just like in a war game, it's important to have more territory. And, of course, it, the greatest thing is to win more material and to checkmate. But usually if you play an experienced player, they will not just give away pieces or allow you to checkmate so simply. So what happens is you need to gain little, little advantages. And one of the most important things in that aspect is to gain space. And that's what White is trying to do here. Another important element is the activity, the mobility of the pieces. And that's what we will see in this game, actually. The difference between the activity, mobility, between the two camps. Black plays f5. White with uh, his last move by playing the knight to e5 opened up the power of the bishop to attack the pawn on e4. So black is protecting the pawn with the f pawn on f5. White responds with f3. Now this is one interesting thing in chess. That, for example, black has a disadvantage here by having double pawns on the e5. That's a disadvantage because usually the, black, the back pawn of the double pawns has, is very limited. It cannot move because there is a front pawn. However, the interesting part is that very often when you have one type of advantage, you need to find a way how to transform it to a different, bigger type of advantage. And that's what's happening here. White is willingly trading off that double pawn, but gaining more control of the center and giving more activity to his pieces, to its bishop. E takes f3. Black has not much of a choice because pushing the pawn to e3, the pawn would be far too advanced, all surrounded with enemy pieces, and the pawn could be attacked probably after a trade on, of the knights on d7, let's say, and then attacking the pawn. The pawn is lost very soon. So black had no choice but to trade. White captures back the pawn with bishop takes f3. The bishop took back, and the plan is to play e4 soon. Queen to c7. Queen to c7 is trying to put pressure on the knight. Black was already attacking the knight twice, but it was protected twice by the bishop and pawn. Now black put a third attacker on the knight. It's a, s a small mistake, I would say. Uh, black was better off trading the knights, and then when white takes back, give a check. But nevertheless, white still has a small advantage. Because of space advantage, white controls more space on the board, and black's problem is still, as I mentioned before, this bishop has serious difficulty in getting active play. So black played queen to c7. Knight takes d7. Knight took on d7, trading the knight. Knight had to move. Of course, moving back is not so good, because that's retreating. White had something specific in mind after trading the knights. Bishop takes d7. Naturally, the bishop wants to develop. White plays e4. Now, this is a very crucial move of the game. With this move, white occupies the center and gains space and activates more the bishop and opens more fires and diag diagonals for his pieces. E5. Well, this is a risky move because now the 
position opens up completely. On the other hand, if black doesn't do that, then white can gain more space by playing e5. So black had to choose of two unpleasant things. e5. c5. Now white has to play very, very accurately, because if white doesn't do that, black is almost, almost equalizing, or could even get a better position by the rook coming to d8, and black is pretty much centralized, so white has to play very forcefully here. Let's see the exact moves. Each move is very accurate on white side. How to do it? c5, attacking the bishop. Black retreats the bishop to f8. The bishop returned all the way to f8, not blocking the rook's file. Queen to c2. That's a very fine move. It puts pressure on the pawn on f5. White is threatening to take. Also, at times, the queen can appear on this diagonal. E takes d4. Black took the pawn on d4. Also, of course, both pawns were hanging on e5 as well as f5. One more thing about the move of queen c2. White could not take the pawn right away because then the pawn on c5 is unprotected and black would capture with a check. So the other important idea of the move queen c2 was to protect the pawn on c5 as well as attacking the pawn on f5. That's one important thing in chess. When you can make multi-purpose moves, that's usually very, very good because at one go you attack and defend, that's very good, that's saving time, and time is very important in chess. So black played, e takes d4. e takes f5. Now white broke the balance, did not take back the d4 pawn, but captured the pawn on f5. With this move, white still has an attack on the pawn on d4, while the f5 pawn is nicely protected. So now black needs to do something about protecting the pawn. Rook a to d8. This move indirectly tries to protect the pawn. Bishop to h5. White doesn't rush to take the pawn, but has an intermediate move by attacking the rook on e8, improving the bishop's position to h5. Rook to e5. The rook moved away, attacking the c5 pawn, as well as putting some pressure on the f5 pawn. Bishop takes d4. Now the game gets very tactical. Bishop took the, the pawn, attacking the rook. Rook takes f5. Now this is a tactical variation when black is sacrificing temporarily a piece in order to gain it back very soon. Rook takes f5. Rook captured on f5. Bishop takes f5. Bishop takes f5. Now it opened up the d file for the rook to capture the bishop next. Queen takes f5. Queen took back. Now black needs to get the bishop. Rook takes d4. And the rook took on d4. Now, this is a very simplified position. And at first glance, it would seem that it's an equal position, right? Equal material, even more so. It's opposite colored bishops, which has a tendency for a draw. Let's say without queens, the game most likely would end in a draw. However, as we'll see the nuance that the black king all of a sudden will get into danger. There are no rooks on the back rank, and that's what will cause black the problem. Rook to f1. Now we will see the difference between the activity, the mobility, between the white and the black pieces. White is gaining the initiative by this last move coming the rook to f1. 
doubling up on their file, the battery between the rook and the queen. The queen now is threatening to hit the bishop and checkmate right away. Black retreats to rook to d8. Rook to d8 protects the bishop. Moving the bishop away instead by bishop to e7 would end the game very quickly as well after queen to f7 check and then king h8 and now either queen e8 or queen f8 either one checkmates in two moves. So black played rook to d8 protecting the bishop. Bishop to f7 check. This is the first move of this winning combination now, forcing the king to the corner. King to h8. Black had absolutely no choice but moving to the corner. And now comes the critical moment. And I would advise you to take a break and try to think what's the beautiful move now for white. Bishop to e8. This is one of the evergreens of chess. It's a beautiful move. It's a very rare move. A bishop moving to e8, especially winning the game. Now the threat is queen takes f8. If the rook takes the bishop, still queen takes f8, followed by rook takes queen, and then rook takes rook checkmate. Moving the bishop doesn't help. Still, white checkmates with queen to f8. Black resigns. Seeing this beautiful evergreen game, we learn the following. After in the opening that both sides played well, controlling the center, in the middle game, on the other hand, white was able to gain more control of the center. And in a crucial moment, when the game started to open up, Opening up a, a game means trading pawns. That's how we open files and diagonals. White was able to get a more active position. So it's also important in chess to try to control as many squares as possible. That's what we really mean by activity of the pieces, to have as much control of the squares, of the files, diagonals as possible. And uh, white positioned his pieces more actively than black. As you could see, the black bishop was back on f8, and uh, black didn't cross much of the sixth rank, while white was going ahead and gaining space. Then, towards the end of the game, white was able to find some tactics. Now, that's an interesting thing. Sometimes you think that, oh, white got lucky, some tactics happened to be, th be there, and that's how white gave checkmate. But I strongly believe it's not a matter of luck. It's because white was gaining space. It, it was because white was gaining better mobility of the pieces, better control of the files and diagonals. That's why the tactics happen to be there. And it's interesting that it, they always are there. Whoever mobilizes the pieces better, centralizes better, will always have some kind of tactical justification as well of the strategical advantage. talk about the third principle that we mentioned in the beginning, and that is king safety. That's very, very important. As Paul said in the beginning, no matter how nice position you have, how many little advantages you have, or even material advantage, if your king is not safe and you're getting checkmated, you're in trouble. So we're going to talk about this now in the next few games. There are two types of things that we need to worry about the king's safety. One is in the opening, when one side does not castle early. We will see some examples of that now. Even sometimes strong players tend to forget that. Of course, it happens only very rarely with strong players. But I want to show you several examples when that happens. The second case is when one side castles, but then recklessly opens up in front of the king. 
by moving one or more of the pawns right in front of the king. So first we'll see examples when black does not castle or one side does not castle and the king stays in the middle of the board. How to take advantage of that? Our first game is from Italy between two Italian players. White starts with e4. You're back to a king pawn start. c5. Appropriately, this is a Sicilian defense. Black controls the d4 square. It's the most common response to the king pawn start. Knight to f3. Again, the most common second move in this position. White develops, controlling two center squares. Knight to c6. In this position on the second move, black has numerous good choices. Knight to c6, what black played in this game, is one of them. Another two most common responses would be d6 opening up the bishop or e6 opening up the other bishop's development. This game, black continued with knight to c6, controlling two center squares, d4 and e5. Bishop to b5. In this position, the most common move is to play d4, right away occupying the center and playing the so-called open Sicilian. However, there are other alternatives, like in this game, white playing bishop to b5, developing the bishop, playing the so-called Rossolimo variation. The idea of this move is, besides of developing the bishop, preparing to castle, as well as in some variations to capture the knight on c6, and therewith creating double pawns on the c file for black. This is a very well playable alternative to the most common open Sicilian. G6. This is one of the two main roads for black here to develop the dark squared bishop to the g7 square to the long diagonal. The other one would be to also develop the bishop but the other direction with e6. So in this game black played g6. White castles. White continues the normal way, putting the king in safety. Bishop to g7. So far everything goes very normal. Both sides are developing the perfect way. Knight to c3. In this position, white has a number of ways to continue. White could play c3, a common way to control the center and prepare the advance with d4. Another very common way is to play the rook to e1, also to prepare at times to push the pawn to e5. Knight c3 is also a very normal move by developing and focusing on the center. Knight to d4. This move is breaking a general principle as of not to move the same piece twice in the beginning of the game. Black is better of developing. However, it has some merits too. The knight is trying to attack the bishop. Trading a knight for a bishop is usually a good thing. What, what is the difference between the bishop and the knight in chess? To have a pair of bishops is great because together the two bishops can control all the squares on the chessboard. However, if you lack one of your bishops, let's say black is able to trade the bishop for the knight, then white has somewhat of a weakness on the light squares because white has no bishop on the light squares whereas black can control with the two bishops all the squares. So normally I would say don't allow that to happen that you give up a bishop for a knight. There may be exceptions to that. For example, if a position is locked up, it's a very closed position, when the pawns are all next to each other and are unable to move, those may be exceptions when the knights are better than bishops. However, in positions that are open or not yet determined, like right here, never trade a bishop for a knight. Bishop to a4. Understandably, white is trying to keep his bishop on the board. It would also be possible to retreat the bishop to c4. e6.
Black is trying to develop the knight, but it causes another problem. It weakens the d6 square. Knight takes d4. White is trying to take advantage right away of black's inaccuracies. C takes d4. In the game, black captured back with a pawn. Capturing with a bishop is also not very advisable because the knight would also go to b5, threatening with two things right away. A, capturing the bishop, which would not only gain the pair of bishops for white, but also it would be really, really bad for black. It weakens the dark squares here, and especially when both of these pawns moved already, it looks really, really weak. And white still has a dark squared bishop. So in situations when the opponent has a dark squared bishop, this is very, very dangerous. Those squares are very weak. The second threat white has is to jump into d6 and strip black from castling. So that's why black chose to take back with the pawn on d4. Knight to b5. The knight moves to b5. Now here it's important for white to be sure that the knight will be able to get to d6 because otherwise the knight would be a little bit off-center and uh, misplaced. However, right now the knight is threatening to jump into d6. Queen to b6. Black needs to prevent the knight to get in from d6 because that check would force the king to move and then black would lose the right to castle for the rest of the game. Now, uh, natural looking move, d6, that would not allow the knight to jump to d6 normally is very bad because in this case there is a discovery here and by the knight moving to c7 it's a double check and white wins a rook on a8 in the corner. So that's why black prevented the knight check with queen to b6 directly by controlling the d6 square. C3. Here we are getting to a crucial part of our subject. What are we talking about? We are talking about situations when one side doesn't castle in time, when the king stays in the middle. How to take advantage of that? Black is only two moves away from castling. Black, all he needs to do, get the knight out and then castle and then certainly black would have a reasonable position. However, it's white's turn and white's job is not to allow black to comfortably do those two moves that they need to complete development. And the method to do that is try to open the position. What do we mean in chess by opening the position? Opening the position usually means trading pawns. That's how we open files and diagonals. And that's exactly what white is accomplishing with the last move. C3 offering this trade between the pawns. E5. Black is trying to keep the position as closed as possible. For example, if instead black would trade the pawns on C3, white would recapture with the pawn, opening the D file for the queen and renewing the threat of knight D6 check as well as opening up the diagonal of the bishop, threatening bishop e3, developing by attacking the queen. So black played e5. c takes d4. Nevertheless, white trades pawns. a6. This is an interesting moment. Black is making an intermediate move. We call that when one side doesn't make the natural, the obvious move, such as recapturing a pawn. The reason for that is because if black would do that, black would have several problems. A, a strategical problem, that black has doubled isolated pawns. Isolated pawns we call pawns that has no pawn on either side. They are a lot weaker than connected pawns like that. Also, white has an immediate tactical way to gain advantage out of this situation. By playing e5, again, white would renew the threat 
of the knight d6 check because black could not capture this pawn on e5 because white can create a pin attacking the bishop. The bishop cannot run away. And after black protects the bishop, white would attack the bishop again. And the bishop is still pinned and therefore cannot run away and the bishop is lost. Now let's go back to the situation in the game after pawn takes on d4 black made the intermediate move attacking the knight with a6 knight c3 again white is following the general principle of controlling the center it's a lot better than moving back to the edge of the board the knight moves to c3 controlling two center squares E takes d4. Black took with the pawn. It's not any better to take with the queen because white would again continue with knight to d5, centralizing the knight and gaining time because now there is an immediate threat to fork with knight to c7 and black is in serious trouble already. So the pawn took. Knight d5. Knight d5 is attacking the queen and occupies the center, gains time. Queen d8. The black had to be very careful of controlling the c7 square because if the queen goes to a square that, let's say here, does not control, the knight comes to fork. So the queen had to stay protecting that square. d3. Now it's time to get the bishop involved in the game. The bishop is planning to develop either to f4 to renew a threat of the fork with knight to c7 or depending what black plays like in the game the bishop may develop to g5. Knight f6. Black develops trying to castle just one move away from safety. But that one move is a decisive difference. Bishop g5. This bishop development is a very, very strong move. It creates a pin. It creates an immediate threat to win material. The threat is to attack the knight. Because it's pinned, it won't be able to move away. The threat is to push either the pawn to e5, attacking the knight, or to achieve the same by attacking the knight with the queen from f3. h6 h6 is a very logical response. Black is trying to chase the bishop away that is pinning the knight. Now, if the bishop would retreat, no more pin. So black is more or less safe to castle. If the bishop moves to h4, trying to maintain the pin, Black would push the pawn to g5, and again, the pin is gone. However, white had a surprise prepared. e5. White plays e5. As I said, it's very important to play energetically in these situations, because this is very time sensitive. Black was only one move away from castling, but that one move will never come. h takes g5. Black doesn't have much choice because the knight is pinned. The knight couldn't move. Black would lose the queen if the knight moves. So the only chance is to take the bishop. e takes f6. Pawn to the knight, putting attack on the bishop. Bishop takes f6. Well, black won a pawn. But white also achieved the goal, and that was to open the e5. Queen f3. Now white starts a winning attack. With this last move, white attacks the bishop on f6. It also connects the rooks, getting the rook ready to come to the e5. Bishop to g7. The bishop had to move away. If the bishop moves to e5, trying to lock up the e-file, the problem is 
the bishop will be attacked by either rook, doesn't matter. And the problem is after the only move that would kind of defend the bishop with f6, black is in pins and therefore the knight could capture the pawn on f6 with a check and winning the game. Then the bishop is hanging. For example, if queen would take, of course, black would lose a queen, making things a lot worse. So in the game, the bishop went back to g7. Rook f to e1 check. Rook e1 check. Now, white achieved the goal. No more worry about black castling, because now the black king has to move, and therefore losing the right to castle. King to f8. No other move. Okay. Rook e7. Entering to the seventh rank is usually a great accomplishment in many positions in chess. Just like in this situation, the rook coming to the seventh rank is decisive. White is already threatening actually checkmate by queen taking on f7. In fact, black resigned, and the reason for that is that let's say the only move for black would be to continue by pushing the pawn up to f5 to a protected square. White would get the other rook into the play, doubling up on the e file, creating more threats. For example, rook to e8, and then if queen takes, rook takes, king takes, a fork could come on c7, winning the rook in the corner. And therefore, black resigned. What did black do wrong in this game? Black moved the same piece twice early in the game. Black brought the queen out early in the game. And never got to castle. And that was the main problem that cost black the game. What did white have to do in order to take advantage of black's mistakes? White had to rush and play energetically and open up the position. And in this case, open up the e-file to make sure the king never gets to safety. And that's what white did. Our next game is another famous game played by former world champion Vasily Smyslov against Kotnauer in 1946. E4. No surprise here, although I know former world champion Smyslov, most of his games start with more conservative moves, d4 or knight f3, but in this game he played the ambitious king pawn start. C5. Again, black chooses the Sicilian defense. Knight f3. So far we're following our previous game. d6. Now this is already different. As I mentioned before, black has several choices on this second move. d4. Now this is the open Sicilian. Unlike in the previous game, when white did not open up the position with d4 early on, here, white chooses the open Sicilian, playing d4. C takes d4. In this position, black is best off trading these pawns, not allowing white to trade or to push through and gain space. Knight takes d4. Of course, it's best to take with the knight. We don't bring out queen early, because that could be attacked with the knight. Knight f6. Black develops, controlling the center, attacks the pawn on e4. Knight c3. White does the most logical response, developing, protecting the pawn on e4. 
A6. Here there are many roads for black. G6, for example, would be called a dragon variation. Knight C6 is a common move, the rouser. For E6, the Scheveningen variation. This game, black played A6, which is called the Neidorf variation. Bishop E2. Bishop E2 is a relatively solid way. More challenging ways are bishop to g5, bishop e3. However, bishop e2 is also definitely a good developing move preparing to castle right away. e6. Here black had two main choices. e5 is the more principal way in the Neidorf variation that a lot of people play. However, e6 is not a bad move at all. It transposes to the Scheveningen variation and gives black a solid game with proper continuation. White castles. Normal move, following the basic principles of chess, put the king in safety as soon as possible. b5. Now here black makes a pawn move not necessary. It's better to continue developing, following the basic principles of chess, playing bishop to e7 and try to castle as soon as possible before the king gets stuck there in the middle like he did in this game. b5 is already a small mistake. Bishop f3. This is a very good move in this position based in some tactics. Here white occupies this long diagonal and creates a threat, an immediate threat. The, the threat is to push the pawn ahead to e5 and open up the attack of the bishop to the rook as well as in the same time attack the knight on f6. Rook a7. This is an awkward looking move, but black was in not an easy situation because for example if black would play bishop b7, which is the most natural move here, the following would happen. And this actually brings us to another element. Keep your pieces on protected squares. Let's see what happens when a piece is not on a protected square. White can follow up by playing e5 anyway. Now there are two ways for black to go. One is to take the pawn on e5, then white takes the bishop, attacking the rook. So now if black takes the knight, white takes the rook. So let's say rook goes to a7. Now white has two pieces under attack, the bishop and the knight. So white has to play accurately. Knight c6. Now, this is a discovered attack to the queen. Let's see what happens if black wants to trade queens and then get the bishop back. Problem is, all of a sudden, white checkmate on rook to d8. Let's see what happens if black sees that and instead captures the knight on c6. Now white takes back, and actually white is a piece ahead. And if white is winning even more material after knight d7, the rook is being trapped. After bishop e3, rook goes to c7, and the rook gets pinned by bishop b6, because the knight is also pinned by the other bishop. So let's put the position back, the bishop being on b7, so after bishop b7, white's correct move is e5 right away, also if the bishop takes on f3, white has a winning position after queen taking on f3, and again the rook is hanging as well as the knight on f6. Therefore, bishop b7, the natural looking developing move, unfortunately is not playable, so it was 
not out of pleasure, but out of necessity, that black played rook to a7. Queen to e2. White played queen to e2, freeing the d1 square for the rook. Rook to c7. That's not a great idea. Moving the same piece twice early on in the game is a mistake usually. And so it is in this case. I would much rather recommend continue developing, follow the general principles and try to castle as soon as possible. Of course, black had to pay attention. The knight could not develop to d7 in this very moment because that would allow the fork of the knight on c6. I guess that was the idea behind the move of rook to c7 to prepare that knight development. Rook to d1. White is putting the rook on the half open file. Knight b to d7. And black is developing the queen side. But in general, it's more important to develop the side where you want to castle first. And that's what black will suffer for in this game. A4. As we said before in the commentary to the previous game, the way to take advantage of a king being stuck in the middle is to open files. And in this game too, that's what white is doing. B takes A4. Black is ready and willing to open the file, but things are not easy for black after b4 either, because then the knight would move to a2, attacking the pawn on b4, and when black protects with a5, white could follow up the now available square for the knight, knight to b5, right away attacking the rook, and after rook c6, Again, the discovery is coming by playing e5, white winning material. Let's go back to the game situation where black did take on a4. Knight takes a4. White recaptures the pawn. Bishop b7. In the commentaries, World champion Smyslov was blaming this move as a cause for further troubles, although after a better bishop e7, black is in difficulties as well, I think, because the bishop would come to d2 and would threaten to appear very unpleasantly with a pin with bishop a5. Let's see what's the problem with bishop b7. e5. Now things are getting very exciting. This is a pawn sacrifice temporarily. Knight takes e5. There are two other moves that we need to talk about in this position. One would be if black makes the intermediate move by capturing on f3 first. Then the knight would capture back with the idea that after pawn takes, knight takes, and black has an unpleasant pin over the knight on the d file, white threatening to come in with knight b6, and of course the a6 pawn is getting very, very weak. The other move worth mentioning would be what if the pawn takes. In that case, the plan would be capture on b7, and after rook captures back, the queen has time to capture the pawn first, attacking the rook on b7, and only next move the knight away from the attack. Let's go back to the game, where black took the pawn on e5 with the knight. Bishop takes b7. This trade will make the pawn unprotected on a6. Rook takes b7. Of course, black has no choice but to recapture. Queen takes a6. Now white gained back the sacrifice pawn and maintaining the attack. Now the black rook is under attack, the a file is open, and all of a sudden the rook will become also active participant, even without making a single move so far in the game. 
queen to b8. Black protected the rook with this move. Knight to c6. White is playing aggressively again, attacking the queen and offering a trade between the knights. Knight takes c6. If the queen would move instead, let's say, to c7, the problem is a check would come on a8, forcing the king to get out, and then knight could take the knight because there is a pin and black is losing a piece. Therefore, black traded knights. Queen takes c6 check. Queen takes c6. Now the king is in check. Now black has a trouble because either the king has to move, which is very, very unpleasant because once the king moves, it stays in the middle for the rest of the game. Or one of the black pieces have to move into a pin. Knight d7. Moving the rook into the pin is even worse because the knight right away attacks a stronger piece, the rook, and therefore wins material. Knight to c5. And this is a pretty move, the start of a winning combination that ends the game very quickly. It's very pretty, puts the knight under the attack of the pawn, but it's all calculated. D takes c5. Pawn takes knight. Bishop f4. And the second sacrifice, deflecting the queen from the protection of the rook and the back rank. Bishop d6. If black takes the bishop, there are a number of ways to win. One of them is the check with the queen, forcing the king out, blocking the way of the bishop, and then simply picking up the rook, creating a pin on the seventh rank, and the knight will be lost, and then of course the game as well. Therefore, black decided to give up rather the bishop, hoping to block up some of the files by this sacrifice. Bishop takes d6. White takes the bishop with a temple, attacking the queen again. Rook b6. That's a tricky move. On the other hand, the queen could not move because then the rook would fall. It's unprotected. Queen takes d7, check. If white would continue with a natural looking bishop takes queen, black would also take the queen and black would survive. There is equal material on the board and black has good chances to make a draw. However, after the final move of the game, queen d7, white sacrifices the queen, but it's only temporary. After the king would take the king, the queen, I'm sorry, the bishop takes queen, making a discovered check, big difference. Black has no time to capture the bishop, and after the king moves away, the bishop is free to move, and white is a piece ahead. Therefore, black resigns. Again, let's summarize what did we see in this game. Black was trying to combine development on the king's side with development on the queen's side. And that's usually a risky thing to do, because black almost got to castle, but almost did not help. And neither did he manage to develop properly on the queen's side, as we saw in the variation, when black wanted to follow up the b5 move with bishop b7, it had a tactical problem. And therefore, the rook had to make an artificial move, rook to a7 and then to c7, that was really very awkward for black. And what did white do? Just like you learned, when the king is stuck in the middle, we need to open files. Here it was somewhat different than in the previous example, when we were opening right against the king in the middle of the board, which is the more common thing to do. Here we opened the A file and got the rook on the A file involved without making a single move. So that's in a way gaining time, ma taking advantage of a piece without moving, being a participant in the game. Former world champion Smyslov did this in a very effective 
and uh, good way, and uh, all the pieces had a great cooperation, great harmony that succeeded. The next game is played by my sister, Judith Polgar, against the Spanish Grandmaster Magam from the Madrid tournament in 1992. White starts with e4. e4 is Judith's favorite move. Just like Bobby Fischer, she practically starts all her games with this move. c6. This is the Karokan defense quite popular and quite solid and safe for black, playing it properly. D4. White occupies the center with both center pawns. Definitely the best way to start a game. D5. Black also occupies the center. Uh, good response. E takes D5. In this position, white has several good ways to continue. One is to protect the pawn by either knight c3 or d2. Another one would be to push through, gain space in the center, but create a kind of closed type of position. In this game, Judith chose to play a more active way and trade the pawns. c takes d5. In the natural response, of course, taking with the queen is not very recommendable because the knight right away would get out, gaining time by attacking the queen. So the pawn took back. C4. This is the famous pawn of attack. It's very ambitious. It right away challenges black in the center. Of course, it's somewhat risky also because often white gets stuck with an isolated pawn after the disappearance of these two pawns. But white tries to play aggressively and tries to develop an attack early on. Knight f6. The best response, developing, controlling the center. Knight c3. White does the same, develops, controls the center. e6. Again, a good move for black, putting more protection on the central d5 pawn square and opening up the dark squared bishop to come out. Knight f3. White also develops, controlling the center. So far, everything is normal. Bishop b4. In this position, black has two standard choices. Bishop b4, very common, or more solid, bishop to e7, also possible. c takes d5. With his last move, black created a pin over the knight, and white decided to trade right away. White also can move the bishop. The drawback of that is that then black would already trade himself. And white needs to waste two moves, moving out first with the bishop and then to recapture. And that's what white wanted to avoid, rather trading herself and then the bishop would develop in one move instead of wasting two moves. Knight takes d5. After taking back the pawn on d5, Black has a serious threat because there is a pin over the knight. Knight, of course, cannot take on d5. And black is threatening himself to take on c3. And if pawn takes back, then bishop takes, making a fork by checking the king and attacking the rook all at once. White plays queen b3. That's one of the ways to protect the knight. Another way, common way, would be to protect with the bishop, which Judith did play in some of her other games. Knight c6. Black continues to develop. It's a right move. Bishop d3. Also, white develops, prepares to castle, which would get out of the pin at the same time. Bishop e7. Black retreated the bishop 
that may be a questionable move. Another move that Black tried here in a later game, the same former world champion Smyslov, against Judith herself in a few months after this game, is to play Queen b6. And Smyslov managed to draw that game. White castles. So, so far, white managed to put the king in safety, develop most pieces. The only one left is the bishop on c1. Knight d to b4. This is a crucial moment of this game. And in most chess games between good players, that moment comes when decisions have to be made. Risk has to be taken or not taken and playing more passively. And this is one of those situations when black has the choice to, let's say, castle, play a more conservative game. But here black decided to move the knight to b4 with the aim to open up the attack on the pawn on d4 and gain a pawn. However, as we shall see, the price is that the king will never get to castle. And that's a very risky thing. Bishop e4. Black with his last move attacked the bishop also on d3, not just the pawn. So therefore, white, of course, rather gives up a pawn than the bishop. Knight takes d4. Black's last move would lose sense unless black now takes the pawn, because, for example, if now black castles instead, then already, let's say after a3, the knight would get really misplaced going to a6. So, therefore, black already continues with the plan and captures the pawn. Knight takes d4. Now, there are a series of moves that white gains time by forcing black either by capturing something or attacking a black piece. Queen takes d4. The queen has to take back. Rook d1. And here comes the first of several moves when white is attacking the black piece, not giving black the time to castle. Now the black queen has to go. Queen to e5. The queen uh, had to go someplace, and uh, the white rook now also occupies the d file. Queen to a4, check. Now, this is a very important check, and this is what you should look for when you want to prevent your opponent from castling. Try to give a check that forces the king to move, because once the king moves from its initial position, it can no longer castle. King f8. Blocking the check would be, of course, very, very bad because the bishop could take, and after pawn takes, queen takes, white not only wins a pawn back, but makes a fork and wins the rook in the corner. Bishop e3. With this move, white completed development. All the white pieces are developed. They are in pretty good locations, the rook on the open file, the two bishops in the center, pasting in both directions, in the king's side and the queen's side. And black still has difficulty with developing the bishop on c8. And of course, the king already moved, so therefore the rook on h8 is also stuck. f5. Now black is trying to get some activity by making this move. Black attacks the bishop on e4 and also tries to get the king out to f7 so the rook can get out and then black could castle artificially by moving the king to g8. Of course, white has different idea about that. Bishop f3. Bishop had to move and importantly here we'll see soon why. Rook g8. Let me tell you what's the idea behind this move. If black would play, as I said, king f7, trying to castle artificially, white planned to give a check. Now the only logical move would be to block, because if the king goes back, of course, you even get checkmated, but the whole purpose is ruined of getting the rook out. So the pawn blocks, and then the problem is, Again, a piece unprotected in the corner. White, white makes a skewer by attacking the queen. Once the queen moves, 
the rook is hanging. So therefore, Grandmaster Majan moved the rook away from that dangerous position there. A3. With this move, Judith pushes the knight back to an even less active position than before. Knight has to go back. Knight A6. All other squares, the knight would be captured right away. Rook A to C1. It's amazing how white has time to optimize the position of all the pieces. As we can see, the two rooks now are pasting on the two open files. Two bishops are beautifully pasting, looking in both directions. Knight is controlling the center. The queen is also available to come over to the queen side if needed and pasting on the diagonal too. It's a, it's a beautiful position for white. King F7. Black is still trying to get that rook out, as I mentioned before, to try to get the king into the corner, into safety. Knight b5. That's a strong move, getting the knight into an even better position. On one hand, it eyes to the a7 pawn to simply capture it, and also at times the knight could come into some centralized squares as d6 or d4, depending on what black plays now. Rook f8. Well, black still is trying to get the king to the corner. Now let's talk about something here for a moment. If we count material, black is ahead of pawn. However, white has more than sufficient compensation for the pawn. White has a fantastic piece placement, while black is still undeveloped, the bishop, the rook is out of play, and the king is still in a very vulnerable situation. While also, the queen is not a piece that's supposed to be in the middle of the board, because it's very vulnerable. It can be easily attacked, as you will see, and it will be attacked. Bishop d4. Bishop d4 attacks the queen right away. The queen has very few places to go to. Queen f4. Queen is still trying to stay in the middle as much as possible. Queen b3. This move protects the bishop, prepares a possible g3 move that would attack the queen. Rook d8. Finally, black had an opportunity to move to g8. Why didn't he do it? After that move, white has a tactics. Starting with rook takes bishop, an exchange sacrifice, and when either rook takes back, actually, the queen takes on e6. King f8, and then bishop takes another sacrifice, forcing the king out in the open, followed by queen e7, and black gets checkmated within a couple of moves with a few more checks. Let's put the position back to rook d8. Okay, we're back to the position after rook d8. g3. Now, this move attacks the queen, and the queen is it getting into trouble? Queen b8. That's a horrible looking square for the queen, but the choice was not much better. If the queen goes to g5, bishop e3 comes, or after queen h6 also, bishop e3, for example, g5, rooks got traded, and now white can choose between knight d6 check or knight a7, both winning the bishop. So let's put it back to queen to b8. Queen e3. This is a devastating move. has a killing threat of bishop e5. And the poor queen has no place to go. That's really sad for a queen. Bishop f6. Well, trying to prevent the bishop coming to e5. Bishop takes f6. White captures. 
root text d1 check. Well, black is trying to have an intermediate move because if black captures back right away, of course the rook would be unprotected on d8. Rook takes d1. Simply recapturing, taking control of the d file. King takes f6. Black recaptures the bishop. In fact, if you look at the position, black is still a pawn up. But what a horrible, horrible position black has. All the pieces having no moves practically. The queen has no place to go. Anywhere it moves, it would be captured. The rook has no move. The bishop can only move into a capture. The knight is also very sad on the edge of the board. And the king is walking in the middle of the board. That's a real bad combination. Rook to d8. And this move paralyzes completely black's position and also threatens with some checks to attack the king. Black resigns. The only move that black would try to get out of the bind on the queen's side, queen e5, that's almost good. For example, if white would trade queens, it wouldn't be as horrible. However, right away a check would come forcing the king away from protecting the queen, and black would lose a queen. In this game, white, early on the game, sacrificed the pawn in order to force the black king to give up the right to castle. White managed to give a check, and black had no choice, move the king. After that, white was in no rush. White could improve the position slowly but surely, optimizing the position of each piece. And that's what happened, while at the same time, the black pieces had to go backwards into horrible positions. The black queen got to go almost to the corner with nowhere to move, while the king got centralized. That's certainly the wrong way around. Finally, let's see some of my own games. The next game we'll see I played in Oklahoma in 2004. D4. That's the way I start many of my games, although I sometimes vary by starting with a king pawn or even knight f3 on first move. D5. That's a very standard move, very solid trying to keep the balance in the center. C4. C4, this is a temporary pawn sacrifice. Offering the pawn, but accepting it is very possible, but black would not keep the pawn for very long. White could gain the pawn back quickly by attacking with the bishop, or sometimes even playing knight f3 first, and only later e3, black cannot keep the pawn too long. By the way, the theme of this game is different from the past three games that we saw, when the king got stuck in the middle. In this game, we will see an example when black does castle properly, however, then later opens up the defense in front of the king, and that's why the trouble will come. e6. My opponent played e6, protecting the pawn. This is the queen's gambit declined. Knight c3. The most common developing move, controlling the center. Knight f6. Black does the same, develops, controlling the center. C takes d5. This is the so-called exchange variation. White has several other good moves here developing the bishop, creating a pin, or developing the knight, also all good moves. It's a matter of taste which one you choose. I myself chose many, many times the other two options as well. E takes d5. Black usually captures back with the pawn in order to open up the diagonal for the bishop. 
bishop g5. Now we're ready. It's time to develop the bishop and to create a pin. Bishop e6. That's a little bit strange move because first, as I said, we should develop the king side to castle as soon as possible. Normal moves are bishop e7 or actually even c6 to connecting these pawns or knight bd7, which by the way is something worth talking about. This is a very famous trap that some people fell into. Now, it seems that white can use this pin and win a pawn by capturing the pawn on d5. But it's not quite so, because black can still take the knight on d5, allowing the bishop to capture the queen, because bishop check comes, forcing the black with the queen, then bishop takes, king takes, and after king takes bishop, if you do a counting, black won a knight for only losing a pawn. So that's certainly a big mistake for white to try to grab that pawn. And of course, I would not have done it in case my opponent would have played the knight to d7, but he played bishop to e6. e3. That's a solid way to let the bishop out. c6. That's again a common way to connect these pawns to protect the center d5 square. Bishop d3. Developing, controlling a very important square in this opening, the e4 center square. Bishop e7. Black finally develops the kingside bishop and now the pin no longer exists, the knight is free to move. Queen c2. The purpose of this move is mainly to control the e4 square another time. Also, in certain cases, white considers a long side castling, queen side castling. Knight b, d7. This queen c2 move actually had one more idea and that is to prevent black from castling immediately. If black would have done that, white can win a pawn by removing the knight from f6, capturing, and then black recaptures the pawn on h7, can be taken by the bishop winning a pawn. My opponent connected the knights with knight b7. Knight g, e2. Knight e2. Here I have two ways to develop my knight. Knight to f3, also not bad, controlling two center squares. However, I had a different plan, as we'll see shortly what it is. Black castles. Let's see what's the difference now compared to the previous move. If now, I would again take the knight on f6. Black has an additional way to recapture my bishop, and that is with the knight, which will protect already the pawn on h7. White also castles. Now I completed also the development. All my pieces are developed, my rooks are connected, so did black. But my piece placement is somewhat better than black's. The bishop here, even though it's developed, it's somewhat in an uncomfortable position because it could be attacked potentially with the knight or sometimes even it's in a danger of being trapped by the pawn f4, f5 moves. h6. Now this move, I think, is another small mistake. When there is this battery between the bishop and the queen, it's quite dangerous to make this move. The common plan for black in this position would be to move the rook to the half-open file. Even though there are all these black pieces right now blocking the rook's power on the e file, it's still considered an open file from black's perspective because it doesn't have any black pawn on that file. The purpose of this move is besides putting the rook where it belongs to free the f8 square for the knight and then to move the knight to g6 
very nicely defends the king and also at times is ready to attack maybe against the white king. Now, if you look back at black's h6 move, it takes away this opportunity for the future. If black after the h6 move wants to do the same plan, the knight will always be hanging there because there is a twofold attack by the queen and the bishop. So after bishop takes and pawn takes, the queen would win a pawn. So that's a long-term strategical error. Also, at times, of course, after the bishop is gone, the queen and the bishop may trade places. And there is an eventual checkmate plan on h7. h6. Bishop h4. Of course, I would not want to trade a bishop for a knight just like that without any specific reason. I moved away my bishop. c5. That's a risky plan for black because now I have the chance to trade off the d-pawn versus the c-pawn, creating a long-term weakness in the d5 pawn for black. Probably it was better off to play more solid with rook e8, knight f8, and kind of trying to wait and see what happens. Although I think white is clearly better, as I said, the plans passively f4, f5, knight f4, or even another plan that I used in some of my other games, f3, bishop f2, and playing e4. My opponent played c5. D takes c5. That's necessary, because otherwise black's move would get justified. Black would push through with c4, and black would get some space advantage, and the pawn majority on the queen's side nicely advanced. Knight takes c5. That's the logical response, attacking my bishop. Black wouldn't mind to trade my bishop for the knight. And white plays bishop f5. I'm trying to avoid the trade between the knight and the bishop. The plan is to put pressure with my rooks on the d5 isolated pawn by doubling up and then putting more pressure by bringing my knight to f4. Usually black is in serious trouble holding on to that pawn on d5. Rook c8. That's a good move. Black is occupying the open file. And of course my queen is on that file. So therefore I have to be careful not to step into a discovered attack. For example, if I move my knight away, then this knight may have some discovered attack or even in this case it could be some kind of pin situation. Knight d4. The purpose of this move is to block the weak isolated pawn. The knight is the best blocking piece. Therefore, the knight stands very good on d4. Also, it puts pressure on the bishop on e6. So the knight cannot move away. It needs to hold on to it. Bishop takes f5. Black did not want to allow knight takes e6, although I'm not sure if I would have rushed with that capture anyway. Queen takes f5. I could also capture back with my knight, but I did capture with my queen. So my queen puts right away pressure on the d5 pawn. I could capture, let's say, with my bishop, the knight on f6, and then win the pawn on d5. And now black plays g5. Well, g5 is the move, actually, that's the subject, what I want to talk about. With this move, black had a nice protected king's position and now opened up. That's very, very risky. And in fact, it's a big mistake. Black should not do that. The best move black can do is play knight e4, and then the game would be more strategical playing against the isolated pawn. Now, this is a crucial moment of the game. I had to make a serious decision. Obviously, the bishop has to move. Well, I can play solid with bishop g3, maintaining a positional advantage. Or, I could sacrifice my bishop and destroy the protection of the black king, getting two pawns for my bishop. But two pawns for a piece is usually not enough. 
However, here I have an attack as well. So I have to evaluate, is the attack good enough to compensate for the sacrifice? I chose to sacrifice. Bishop takes g5. So I'm giving up the bishop for two pawns. H takes g5. Black must capture the bishop, at least to have the material advantage if the king is unsafe. Queen takes g5 check. Okay, so I got two pawns so far and a check. King h8. This is the better place to go with the king. If the king goes to h7 in some variations, the knight will not be able to block the check, so it will be even easier to finish the attack. Knight f5. Well, this move has a very obvious threat, namely checkmate on g7. Knight e6. That's the best response. It not only protects the g7 square, it also attacks the white queen. If black would play rook to g8, that seems to do the same purpose, protecting the g7 square and attacks the white queen, the queen would go to h4, checking the king, and even though black can block the check, black is losing the bishop on e7. Knight e6. Queen h4 check. Now, here comes a very important nuance. The queen could check from either h6 or h4. If I check from h6, the knight can block, and black is hanging on. On the other hand, after the check on h4, if black tries to do the same, then the bishop is being lost. King g8. Therefore, black had no other choice than moving the king. f4. This moment is actually very important because I have the queen attacking, the knight attacking. I need to bring some more force into the attack. The question is how? The knight is pretty far away. It would take quite a number of moves to get it closer to the opponent's king. This rook, there is no easy way to get it into the game. So this is the rook that I want to get into the game, the rook on f1. That's the idea of the move f4, preparing to bring the rook out to help in the attack. Rook c7. The purpose of this move is to protect the bishop, as we've seen in several variations. When the knight wanted to move to block a check to h7, the bishop was hanging. That was the idea of the move, to protect the bishop. Let's see some other possibilities here for black. For example, if black plays rook to e8, then again the rook comes out to f3, threatening check on g3, and after king f8, check on h8. Actually, the best response here for black would have been bishop to b4. So white must improve, play differently. Give the queen check, not the rook check, forcing the king to the corner, and then bring the rook to h3. Now, if black plays the obvious rook to g8, attacking the queen, the easiest way to win is checkmate in two by sacrificing the rook. When king takes, Queen h5, checkmate. A better defense for black is to play rook c7, with the idea that if white plays the natural queen h5, putting more pressure on the knight, then opening up the seventh rank with the f6 move and bringing the rook into the defense of the knight. However, white has a better way to play here, and that is to play knight d5, starting a nice simplifying combination. When the queen takes the knight, then still rook takes knight, check, king takes, queen check on h5, king
king g8, and the discovered check, knight h6, winning the queen on d5, and after king takes, queen takes, king takes, knight, and the resulting position is clearly, clearly better for white. White has three extra pawns, and the king is still in a vulnerable position with all open uh, files around it. So now, let's go back all the way to the game position. So in this position, my opponent played rook to c7, not bishop to b4. That made my life easier. Rook f3. Bringing the rook to the attack, the threat is very serious. Chuck, followed by checkmate. Knight e8. Well, this is a discovered attack on the queen. Let's see what would happen after a different discovered attack. If the knight moves to h7, also attacking the queen, then a chuck would come, and after king h8, the queen would simply move away from the attack, threatening to simply double up against the knight on h7, and after let's say f6, with the idea of again moving the bishop and bringing the rook to protect the knight. The problem is the rook does not come from here, from h3, but it will come from g7, attacking the knight, and then if knight captures the rook, winter captures the rook, knight, checkmate. So going back to the game, knight went to e8. Queen h6 simply moving the queen away and black is helpless against the upcoming check on g3. For example, if black plays f6 trying to open up some space for the king to run away, still the check comes and king f7 doesn't run too far because in g6 checkmates. The only thing black could do here is to somehow give up a piece on g5 but then I get my sacrificed piece back maintaining my extra two pawns and the attack. Black resigns. In this game, black made some small positional mistakes in the opening, but the real mistake was, even after black finished development, control the center, put the king in safety, that it recklessly opened up in front of the king, allowing me to sacrifice a bishop for just two pawns. However, opening up files against the black king and develop a decisive In our final example, I'm going to show a game of mine that I had the black pieces for a change against the Norwegian Grandmaster Simon Agdestein. This was an exhibition match in Oslo, Norway in 1996. This team will be somewhat different from the previous games. In this game, both sides follow the general principles, developing, controlling the center, castling. However, it will be distinctly different from all the previous games. The two sides castle on opposite side. Now those positions have very distinct characteristics. Unlike when you castle on the same side, the game usually develops in a more solid, quiet, positional manner. When the two sides castle on opposite sides, usually it becomes a race of attack against each other's king and often it involves a number of sacrifices, especially of pawns. Let's see how this game developed. D4. As we've seen so far, this is a standard opening move. D5. I also control the center. C4. Similar to the previous game so far. E6. Again, declined Queen's Gambit. Knight C3. So far, exactly the same as the previous game. 
C6. Now, this is the first difference. Now we're transposing to the Meran defense. E3. Here white voluntarily closes up the bishop. It's optional. Knight to f3 is also well playable. It's a different plan. Knight f6. Normal, developing move, controlling the center. B3. This is a somewhat rare move order, developing the queen side first. More common, a lot more common, would be developing the knight, and then the bishop and castling short side. But my opponent had a different plan for this game. Knight b, d7. Again, normal developing move, developing the knight, controlling the center. Bishop b2. A logical follow-up of the previous move, of b3. Again, when you play b3, follow it up right away with the bishop developing to b2. Bishop d6. I solidly continue my development, getting ready to castle, controlling the e5 square, possibly getting ready to open up the position after castling only, of course, to play e5. Queen c2. White is making the plan kind of obvious, trying to castle to the queen's side. It's quite rare in this type of queen pawn openings, and it's somewhat risky, as we'll see. Black castles. Simply put my king in safety. White castle, queen side. While this has been played before, it's extremely rare, I would say, and I was quite pleased to see that that's what my opponent played. A5. Well, this is what I've been talking about, that when the two sides castle on opposite sides, it becomes a race, meaning that the race is to open up files against the king. Just like in the previous game, we've seen how much trouble the king got to when the h and the g files got opened up. My aim is the same here, to try to open up the a and b files so my rooks can attack against the white king. A5. Knight F3. Now white continued developing. A4. And A4. This is a pawn sacrifice. As we can see, white can capture it. Knight takes A4. If white does not capture, I would still get to open the A file by trading myself, and my rook would get an open file, and that could attack the white king. D takes C4. Well, this trade is good because the bishop cannot capture back, which would be the natural response, because if the bishop captures back here, I can make a fork by playing B5. B takes C4. That's why my opponent captured back with a pawn, but here I had something planned. B5. That was my whole idea, to give up another pawn in order to open up all A, B, and C files against the white king. C takes B5. White grabbed the other pawn, a very risky thing, but no choice at this point. C takes B5. Captured back. Bishop takes B5. So at this point, white is two pawns up. However, I achieved my objective. All ABC files are open, ready for my rooks to occupy. Bishop A6. Now, this is a move that somewhat contradicts a principle. When you're behind material, when you are attacking, don't trade pieces. Try to keep your pieces for the attack. On the other hand, the defender, the, the side with an extra material, should look to trade pieces. However, here it's very important to free the c8 square for my rook. So that's why time is very important here, and even if it's by the price of trading the pair of bishops. Bishop takes a6. White had to trade, because if the bishop moves away to c6, it would get into a pin. 
after rook to c8, and then the bishop could be attacked and would be lost. So bishop took on a6. Rook takes a6. Capturing back the bishop and also freeing the a8 square for the queen. Knight d2. White is trying to bring some more defense to the king on the queen side. If white tries to run away with the king to the other side, which is a nice dream if white would get there, let's say by getting the rook to e1 and king e2, king f1, king g1, that'd be wonderful, even if it would cost the pawn on a2, because white would still have an extra pawn on d4, but the king would get into safety. However, as you could see, that takes a lot of moves. And namely, after king d2, black right away would give a check on, h, on a5, I'm sorry, attacking the knight, also forcing the knight to get back into a pin, and then black would put more and more pressure on that knight, pinning it again with the rook, followed by the other rook and the bishop. And I checked, the knight does not survive all this pinning and attack. Therefore, the king could not escape by playing king d2, and uh, that's why white tried knight d2. White is already in a very, very difficult position here. Queen a8. Now this is a fine move, even though the queen is in the corner, but it's pasting all the way to g2, attacking a pawn, and also it puts pressure on the knight on a4. Knight c3. Knight had to move, it was under attack, and also it protects now the pawn on a2. Root c8. Well, we're getting there now. All the rook, both rooks, the queen, they are all pasting on the queen side on the open files. This last move created a pin over the knight, therefore there is a threat to take the pawn on a2. Next move. Knight d, b1. Well, white is trying to kind of hold on to the knight because black was also threatening again the same plan, putting pressure over the knight. Rook takes a2. So now I could take the pawn because of the pin and creating another pin over the bishop. Rook d3. White is trying to hold on to the knight as much as possible. Knight d5. Using the pin, now the knight cannot move and it creates an additional threat of knight coming to b4 making a fork on the queen and the rook. Queen b3. The queen moves away from the pin, attacking the rook, although it's not a real attack because the knight is still pinned, so if queen would take, queen takes, white is losing the queen. So I don't have to worry about that. Knight b4. Attacking the rook. Rook d2. Rook had to go away from the attack. Queen takes g2. And now the queen makes a long move, grabbing a pawn, attacking the rook, all at the same time. Rook h d1. Moving away from the attack. Queen b7. And now, this is the final move of the game, and it's really amazing that, again, we get an example of a piece being on an unprotected square, and that's why white suffers. After my last move, queen back to b7, I create a threat of a discovery, moving my knight to d3, giving a check, and attacking the queen all at once, and white is helpless against this. In our last example, what we saw was the two sides castled on opposite sides. And what we need to know about those type of positions, that you have to try to open files, just like when the king stays in the middle, you want to open files against the king. Here, it's an absolute must, because if you don't do it, the opponent may do it, and whoever comes first wins. So that's what I did. I opened the A, B, and the C files against my opponent's king, and as you could see, even in the final position, beautifully, my rook is on the c file, my queen is on the b, and my other rook on the a file, all pasting to attack 
the Viking. I didn't even mind to give up two pawns to achieve this, because these type of attacks, if I succeed to open the files against the opponent's king, are well worth a pawn or two. I hope you have enjoyed the games we covered in this segment of our series. What we focused on in this segment was to focus on the middle of the board, the center. It's very, very important, especially in the beginning of the game, but really in the middle game as well. Also, in the beginning of the game, focus on developing all your pieces and focusing on the center. Combine the two. And then, in some of our other games, we were looking at examples about king safety. Castle, as soon as possible. And even once you've castled, make sure you don't open up Move the pawns away from protecting your king. As you have seen the examples that have been shown by Susan, if you don't follow the principle of chess, even if you're a grandmaster, you can still lose the game. Therefore, I urge you to follow this principle step by step and make sure you follow it every single game. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. Mm -hmm.